Good evening, Hope Reformed Baptist Church. It is tremendous to be with you. Can you please open up to uh, the book of Revelation? Can I just get a show of hands? Did anybody go out evangelizing this afternoon? Any here? Praise the Lord for the, all right, smart, they didn't make it a church. They all were persecuted and killed on the road. Did anybody go out evangelizing for the first time who is currently here? Anyone? There we go. There's one. Did anybody give your first street sermon in the open air today at all? No one? All right. Did anybody give some open air preaching today? Here we go. A couple. Praise the Lord. You read the book of Acts. This is all the stuff they did. They didn't have the printing press. Praise God we do. But they went out to the byways, the highways, found the, 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 the workers, the walkers, the losers, anyone who's out there and proclaimed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to them. Welcome to hope. That's what we are all about. And as you go to Revelation chapter 7, we will be uh, learning tonight again on this theme that we have taken over the uh, last and next few weeks, which is the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of His cross, and all of the effects and all of the benefits that come to us because of the blood of Jesus. Tonight, our text is mainly Revelation 7 and chapter uh, uh, and verse uh, four, uh, 14, but I will be reading for you verse 9 and following for the sake of context, and we will explain it as we go. John says in his apocalypse, in his vision, in the revelation given to him of Jesus Christ, he says, After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. Here's some hints for you. John has already numbered very large numbers in the book of Revelation. That is that he just numbered 144,000. So this number must be bigger than that if he says, this number, I can't number. Tell you what else, he numbered earlier on in about chapter 5, 4 million. He saw a group of 4 million people and he eyeballed that and gave us a number. Now he's speaking about a number which no man could number. This is a number beyond human comprehension. You look at it and it just looks as as if it's a galaxy or an ocean of human souls. And this is symbolic of all of God's people who have believed upon Christ and been saved in this world who are there before God worshipping Him. That's you, I pray. That will be me. I hope I see you there. But this is John's vision. I saw a number symbolizing the total number of all people saved through history. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice. Of course, it's going to be like, I know you sing loud here at Hope Reformed Baptist Church, but millions upon billions upon trillions of souls screaming in the presence of Jesus would be deafening and crying out with a very loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen, someone. Amen. And all the angels were standing around the throne. And around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to be, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? Who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? John gets confused. He thought he was along for the tour guide of heaven and he's been called upon to give an answer. Wasn't expecting this. He says, well, sir, you know, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, the the poem starts, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb is in the midst of the throne. He will be their shepherd and He will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. May God bless this to you and to I this evening. 
Our theme verse here is the answer that the elder gives to John, his tour guide through the apocalyptic heavenly visions that he's having, who is walking with him, explains to him what he's seeing. Now, the tribulation in in Revelation language is sometimes an intense period of persecution upon the church by the world powers and Satan. So there are short periods of tribulation. But there is also uh, the, the, the entire time of Jesus' kingdom that is since he left in his ascension and until he comes back in his second appearance, there is this thing called the tribulation. This entire time of persecution upon the church. And <coughs> John is told by the angel that this innumerable group, this, uh, this choir of people praising Jesus on the throne, this group are those who came out of that tribulation. They are those who, who came out of the world system, who, who came out of this earth, that is, they died, and now they are before the Lamb praising Him. This is the whole number of God's elect and all those who will be saved in and through Jesus Christ. And he says, these are those coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Our theme tonight is the understanding and the idea that the Bible opens up to us, that we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's so many benefits derived for us sinners guilty, vile though we are, there are so many benefits that we can list and have been listing and will list that the scripture shows to us as being causative or originating in the blood of Jesus shed for us and therefore shared with us. And tonight our consideration, friend, is that you and I are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you are not a believer, if you are not a Christian, if you are not a believer in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're not washed. And you sit here dirty, filthy, guilty, vile, stained, unworthy. But those who have believed are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Look also at Revelation chapter 22. You can swing there. I'm going to read it straight away anyway. Revelation 22 verse 14 says... Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. This is another sort of poetic, prophetic uh, revelation language for saying that those who have come out of the tribulation and washed their robes, those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb so that now they are not in filthy coats, or garments speckled and and stained by the sins that they have lived in their life. They are no longer stained by those. They have dipped their clothes. They have washed their robes. And now they wear pure white garments. Revelation 7 shows that they praise Jesus in the presence of the Lamb. Revelation 22 says that you are blessed if you are washed because you can enter the city gates, that is the glorious eternal heaven. And being there, you have access to the tree of life, which you may eat and live forever. This is all just language of being with Jesus forever and ever and ever. That means that the Bible's understanding of salvation is synonymous with the idea of spiritual washing or cleansing. So that when we go into the Old Testament, which we're about to do, and we start seeing all of these uh, stories and these examples and these imageries and commands of ceremonies in the temple worship, when we start seeing this idea of cleansing and washing and you have to be clean to go before God, etc., you're going to realize that what that is painting the picture of, what that is threading together so that it might fit into the tapestry of the cross of the Lord Jesus is an idea of unsaved and saved. Guilty, unclean, or saved, forgiven, righteous, and clean. This is an all-important topic, therefore, for each of us to understand. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10, uh, in speaking about the Old Testament, says, uh, it's, he sort of uh, uh, recaps or summarizes a lot of the Old Testament temple worship and the tabernacle worship. And, and basically, he bo- boils it down to things that pertain to the um, uh, 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 food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body. So, 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 so this is very primary in the Jewish mindset. Maybe not so much in the, in the Gentile, sort of modern Australian, shower once a week, work on a farm. Uh, uh, is that any of us? Amen? Just me? Okay. And our grandparents, right? I just want to make a case that washing daily is a very new invention. It's not weird if you don't necessarily do it. All right? Okay, just me. <laughs> in their day, though, cleansing was not just about hygiene. 
It was not just about smell. In fact, mostly they had uh, uh, nards and fragrances and perfumes and little satchels around their neck or around their wrists for the sake of smelling good. It was kind of just accepted back then without deodorant and, de- and antiperspirants. That everybody smelt. That, that's not the big problem. The, the, uh, in the Jewish mindset, the picture of washing was everywhere over the Old Covenant laws and over the temple worship because it symbolized worthiness to enter God's presence. So, for example, in uh, uh, Exodus chapter 19, we see this wonderful scene as God has saved the, uh, the Israelites out of Egypt. And we studied this a couple of weeks ago. He saved them and spared them from his judgment and his outpouring of wrath upon all those who worship false gods. He poured out his wrath upon Egypt and everyone in Egypt who worshiped false gods, including any Israelites that did not put the blood upon their door. But if they did put the blood of the lamb upon their door, they were passed over and the wrath did not kill them. And we saw that they were spared from the judging angel because of the blood. And Jesus is our greater Passover lamb. But then he also took them out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea. That is that they were saved again through water. They went into the water, but they didn't get wet. They went below the water level, but they were not drenched. Why? Because God opened the water and led them through on dry ground. And then he brings them to Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai was a, was a rocky, enormous, intimidating, imposing mountain in the middle of the desert of Sinai, or the desert of Sin, ironically named, And there is where God would eventually meet with them and sort of presence himself in clouds and thunders and lightnings and trumpets of angels and fire up above, the, on top of the mountain. And eventually Moses and some of the other elders would be invited up into that doomy, uh, Mount Doom vibes of a cloud. And then he would, Moses would come back down later with the Ten Commandments and say, I've met with God, here's our laws. And that, that was where he would, he would go and consult with the Lord. But before God appeared, before God met with the people on the mountain, even though they were going to be distinct and separated by hundreds of meters. Hundreds of meters would separate them and God. He would be on the top of the mountain. They would be in a multitude in the valley of the desert. And yet still, Exodus 19 tells us that God, in speaking to Moses, says, I will come to you in three days' time. Use that time wisely. Use that time to wash the people. Tell them if they will... Even behold my presence. If they'll behold my glory. And sort of have a, have a looking up to the, to the feet of the throne of God. They need to be washed. They need to be cleansed. And so they were. They were commanded to and they did wash themselves before God would appear to them. There is a hint here. There is a hint that there must be a washing before you can behold God in glory. God is giving us a hint there in Exodus 19. And then it goes further in Exodus chapter 29 and 30. God, uh, in Exodus 29, God tells Moses that Levi, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Aaron and the other Levitical priests who were going to be on staff in the tabernacle, basically, they were going to be the priests with the robes and the hats and the, you know, do all of the holy golden furniture stuff and the sacrifices and the incense and the burnings in the temple. All of those men had to come before Moses on a very special, unique, inaugural day. And they had to be washed and cleansed and then consecrated. God was giving us a hint. To serve in God's temple, you must be washed. You must be cleansed of sin. In Exodus chapter 30 then, not only the priests who would serve... But then every single day that they were on shift in the temple, uh, Moses was commanded to build what would be called the brass sea. It was basically an enormous baptismal tank, if you want no other words for it. It was, a, a, it was way classier than a piece of plastic and uh, a, a metal that we got. But it was a beautiful brass basin upon which the priests would, would uh, take water onto themselves and they would wash their hands, their feet, their hair. Sometimes they were commanded to wash their entire selves in that water and it stood in the temple area between the altar where they killed and burned the animals and between the temple. And if they were going to go into the temple, they had to wash. If they were going to go offer a sacrifice, they had to wash. 
So at the beginning, to be able to be a priest, you had to be washed. And then in order to serve God in the temple, you had to be washed. There's another hint. All throughout Scripture in the Old Testament, we see these pictures. Listen to what God said in Exodus chapter 30 to Moses on this topic. He says, when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. This is not merely hygiene. This was not merely uh, uh, some kind of fire retardant upon their clothes when they came near the large barbecue altar. It's not what it was. This was spiritual cleansing being symbolized by water washing. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. There's the hint. They must be washed to serve God in his temple. That means that if you're a Jew, every main holiday, every single main holiday throughout the generations, you go up to the temple, to the main city, to the Big Apple, and you're doing your holiday and your Jewish celebration. Whenever dad takes you up into the temple to watch some of the sacrifices, to offer some of your offerings, you are always, every time you're in the temple, you are always going to see continuously, continuously, continuously as shifts of dozens of men change their shift and do their sacrifices throughout the day and go into the temple continuously you are going to hear the gushing and the washing and the rushing and the refilling of water. You're constantly going to see the washing happening right in front of your eyes. Washing was deeply embedded into the old religious system. There is even, if we take a break from the ceremonial picture, we can also think of a historical uh, narrative that occurs in the Old Testament. And this is in the days of Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 5. And there is a Syrian king whose general was a great and mighty man, but the Bible says he had leprosy. Now, if he had been in Israel, which was a clean and distinct nation under God, uh, the laws would have uh, not permitted him to be a general, not permitted him to be a mighty man or a man of valor in 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 their nation. But in Syria, they made no such distinctions of cleanliness, either hygienic or spiritual. And so he was a general in the Syrian army and uh, uh, he had carried away one of the Jewish girls who now served his wife as a slave. And the young girl said to his uh, master's wife, uh, said, why don't you send your husband back to Israel? Sounds like a ploy to get him killed. Uh, Go back to Israel because there's a prophet there who can heal such things as leprosy. So he gets his big cart together and all of his entourage and him and his gentlemen and the horses and the camels and they go down to Israel and they get there and offer payment to the king. Here's what they think. The king must have the power. The king must be the guy close to God. They come to the king and ask him to heal them at a great price. And the king says, this is some ploy. This is some trap. I know of nothing that can cleanse a man of his leprosy. Doesn't the proverb say that nothing can cleanse a, a, a leper from his spot? Uh, sorry, a, a, a cheat, a leopard from his spots or a leper of his stains? You can't change that. That's, that's set in stone. It's as unchangeable, hear this, as gender. All right. <clears throat> it's as unchangeable as this. It, it, you're born with it. It's stuck with you. That's your life. You, you won't find a wife because she doesn't want leprosy or leprous children. You, you're kind of doomed to die out a very lonely death as a leper. That's just how it is. Or so was the thinking of the king. Until Elisha heard news, he was the prophet, Elisha heard news that the Syrians general had come to town and wanted healing and and he of course sent messenger. And he sent a messenger to Naaman the general and said, here's how you can be healed. Go and wash. Go and wash yourself. Of this old disease, leprosy, which in the ceremonial codes, God had said, if you have leprosy, you can't serve in the temple. In fact, if you have leprosy, it's a, cause, it's a curse of God upon your life and you can't come into the temple even to worship periodically. If you have leprosy, actually, you need to be cut off from the people of God and shunned because there is some kind of sin. And maybe if there's not direct sin, you're just a living example. Sorry, ancient Israelite, you have leprosy. You're just a living pop-up book. Your life sucks to preach a sermon to everyone that will come after you. God does not accept the unclean in his presence. That was your life. And Elijah sent word and said, go and wash seven times 
in the river Jordan, and you will be healed. And that's what he did. Now, there was a little bit of back and forth. He got annoyed. He said, in, in there, isn't there water enough over near where I live that I have to go down to Jordan and do it? And of course, the, the directions were the directions. You must not just wash yourself in any old water, but the prescribed fountain. Here we see that gospel already preached. You not, cannot just accept or, or move towards or approach God through any old religion. I'm sorry, not all rivers lead to Rome. Most rivers lead to hell. There is one river, one lake, one spring, one fountain of life water, which is in Jesus' blood and Jesus' blood alone. Don't hear me preach the gospel and say, oh, but I'm Muslim or, or I'm dabbling in philosophy or Stoicism or, or Hinduism or Buddhism or, or some other type thing. Or, isn't this enough? I'm trying my hardest. No, there's one prescribed fountain. It's Jesus. Flee to him and be saved. You need not wash seven times. You need just call on his name and he will wash you 70 times seven. You will be clean. There's an imagery and a story given to us of Naaman the leper. Here was the hint. There must be cleansing from the sickness of sin. God even showed us in the Old Testament, again with the ceremony laws, again with Naaman and other such instances, that sin could not just be pictured as dirt or uncleanliness or filth upon your clothing. It could also be pictured as sickness, the kind of sickness that is, that is contagious, like leprosy. Leprosy was a very good Old Testament example of an imagery of sin because it spread uh, like gangrene, the New Testament, Paul in 1 Timothy uses this language of sin being like gangrene. If you don't chop it out, it grows and infects everything and kills you. Other examples of, 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 of hereditary uh, sicknesses and illnesses or disabilities, things like a, a damaged eye or a, or a malformed body, uh, uh, some kind of uh, a, a, a reproductive part mutilation or something that happens either congenitally or by accident after you're born, all of these things could disqualify you from being allowed to be in the presence of God. Sickness is, is a picture of sin. And sin is that great hereditary evil. It is that hereditary sickness that the only sort of, of child a, a leprous person can produce is going to be a leprous child. Because it will be, it will be contacted, it will be passed upon. There, there, there are certain, certain uh, 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 conditions or infections that a mother might have for which the doctors will decide you need to have a caesarean cutting you open to deliver your child because if you deliver by the natural course, the child will have too much skin contact and your birth canal will infect them for life. Sin is like this. Sin is not genetic. It's deeper than genetic. It's, it's covenantal. It's universal. It's human. Sickness pictured sin and therefore God was preaching this, this, this sermon. There must be cleansing from the sickness of sin to enter God's presence. But all of that imagery, true though it may be, that there were unclean people able to wash in water and be made clean, the horrible reality is that all of those, just, just, as, their, just as their physical uncleanliness was just a symbol of, but not the reality of their spiritual sinfulness, so also the washings which could clean their bodies, were in fact still only a picture of forgiveness and not the true thing. There was not a single priest that was saved because they washed. There was not a single sin. There wasn't even an inkling of a moment of a motive to sin that a thousand washings actually cleansed from the conscience and the record of any of those priests, let alone the common man. In Genesis chapter 6 and 7, the Lord gives us this picture that he will do a cataclysmic, cosmic, planetary, global washing of sin off the face of this sorry, sunken, stinking earth under mankind's rule and effect. He saw the evil of man's heart being only evil all the time. And he says, mankind is a virus. The earth is sick with them. Sin has infected everything. Therefore, I will wash the globe. It was the cataclysmic and global flood of Noah's day 
in which he and only those with him in the ark were able to be saved. But God said this. In other words, we're thinking of God taking the most unimaginably intense and extreme measures possible so that if ever water could wash away sin, it would have been then. Listen to what God says. I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. Everything on the dry ground in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and the birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. And it had no effect whatsoever, either upon the millions that drowned in the flood or the millions that received a torrential downpouring of rain, water falling, water flooding them, or on the whole human race in general and those eight people in the ark who were thrown around by the water and delivered safely through the waters, a a symbolic baptism. None of them were an ounce less sinful, less blemished and blotted or cleaner in the sight of God because of this torrential cosmic washing. And we think we can do it with some of our good works and penance. Now, the global flood that God sent in rage to wash the earth, if that was a failure to cleanse the earth of sin, then nothing we ever could do We'll do it. The truth is that the sin that stains us, the uncleanness, the uh, stain upon our souls is entirely unwashable by anything in this earth. Water in the Old Testament, though given as a sign of washing, was just that. A sign of washing, but an incompetent washer. It was not actually an agent powerful enough to clean and purify the agents that are washed. Even Pilate bought into this human superstition that so many of us do, that so many other religions do, that so many superstitious pagans do. Pilate, the man who who decreed that Jesus should die, though he knew he wasn't guilty. He knew he wasn't guilty. He fulfilled the prophecies by declaring there is no guilt in this man. And then he fulfilled the prophecies by sending the Lamb of God to be slaughtered. And he fulfilled the prophecies by bringing all of this to happen. And then he says that dreadful, fateful line, I am innocent of his blood. Which was a lie, because he wasn't. But it was also tragic, because sending the God-man to his death, he at least should have invested in a benefit from it. The best thing that Pilate could have said is, let this man's blood be upon me. In a legal sense, that would have been damning and would have ridden him with guilt. But in a conscience, in a spiritual sense, the very blood that he was unrighteously shedding was the very blood that could cleanse him from his unrighteousness. But let's even take another step back and and just watch the picture unfold. That Pilate is trying to be the moral man because his his old missus had a dream. We've all got that, auntie. I had a dream about this guy that you're about to see. I saw a tree and a pearl, and I think that what's being said to me is this. Yeah, well, God gave a dream, a kind of a weird, prophetic, uh, superstitious dream to Pilate's wife. And he sort of brushed it off like, woman, less wine. It's 10 in the morning. What's your problem? But But it still bugged him. It's still, it's still burdened on his heart. His, his wife had said, I had a dream last night about the man you're about to send to be crucified. He's righteous. Don't kill him. I'm suffering much because of the, 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 the comprehension in my mind about this dream of this man. Don't do it. And Pilate brushed it off as he may. Yet when he's standing there in front of the crowd, this angry Jewish crowd, this religious riot, as he's trying to plead with them because of what she said, because what he knows is legal and righteous anyway, as, as his bare, mere conscience is screaming at him, don't kill by crucifixion a righteous young man, obviously, as he's imploring with this crowd, sit down, get off the bleachers, stop lighting that on fire, sit down, what has he done? Get, stop it, stop it. He, he realized he was losing. He couldn't control their vehement rage and violent thirst for blood. So he said, fine, fine, you kill him. I'll hand him over to you to be crucified. But having a bowl brought to him, superstitiously and symbolically, he tried to wash his hands in blood and say, 
I am innocent of this man's blood. Which, despite everything else of all the other evils we could list, that was dumb. That was idiotic, at least. To say the other than evil and cowardly, that was stupid. What is it in H2O that has the ability to change the past, alter your record before the gods? Maybe there was some kind of legal Roman loophole that actually got him out of guilt. I don't know. But in God's court, water doesn't cancel sin. Right? That's not why coastal people are better than rural people. That's not why. And all your landlocked cousins are super weird. That's not why. It's not because water has a cleansing power. Did you think that? I would, I, would, I would understand if you thought that, but that's not actually why. Just kidding. If you're a farmer, don't shoot me. If you're from the city, you don't scare me. Uh, <laughs> the power of water cut short at any ability to cleanse him or his conscience. And Proverbs speaks powerfully to men like Pilate and maybe like you before you became a Christian, maybe like you right now. Proverbs 30 says this, verse 12. There are those who are clean in their own eyes but are not washed of their filth. There are those like Pilate who can walk on home, pull up the blanket, pour a bottle of wine, sit down, drink it, Sleep tight and tell yourself, I'm clean. I'm clean. I I washed my hands, you see? Yeah, maybe maybe you're kind of Catholic and you say, Well, I I went and I did my penance and I I moved, try not to laugh, be respectful. I moved small beads one by one through my digits in my hand until I got to a bigger bead and then I did it again. We call it praying the rosary. Something, something carry the one, I'm forgiven. Yeah, it's great. I met with a pervert behind a small screen and I told him what I did. He didn't confess anything. He told me to call him daddy or father or something. I walked home. I did this or is it this? Now I'm clean. Or any other combination of silly, blasphemous, foolish, superstitious religious acts. I wasn't sure so I put my hand up and the youth pastor dunked me. I got baptized. That, that, I hope that'll do it. I, I went on a pilgrimage and I visited the holy sites and I even know somebody who, who was assured they're going to heaven because they got into the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized and there's got to be something holy and powerful about that blood, uh, that water. Uh, people who have gone to certain areas, I remember on a holiday with, with my family in a certain portion of Asia, a man grabbed my hand and thrust it into a box underneath a temple so that I could feel some weird metal thing. And he says, you have touched the key of eternal life. You are going to heaven, whichever heaven you believe in. Well, that was easy. That was pretty good. But every kind of religious system, every kind of whatever it is that you've tried to do, in order to wash yourself from your sins, which stains your past, are just as silly as Pilate, washing hands and saying, I think I'm now innocent of the most evil act that has ever happened in history. There are those who are clean in their own eyes. Maybe you clean yourself by ignoring and self-acquitting and saying, God's law doesn't apply to me and I'm okay and he sees my motivations. No, there are those who are clean in their own eyes, but they are not washed from their filth. This is many religious people, Christians, Muslims, and others, so-called Christians, I should say. They are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. Jeremiah 2 verse 22 says this, Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord. Though you wash yourself ceremonially, Oh, the Jew might say, Jeremiah, no, no, no. Listen, prophet Jeremiah, I read the Levitical code. I'm doing it the way Deuteronomy tells me to. It's in numbers. I see the passage. I took up lye. I took up uh, hyssop. I took up soap. I took up water. I scrubbed. I scrubbed till I started to bleed. I did the ceremonial thing, oh, Jeremiah. Tell your God that I am clean. Jeremiah says, no. There is a way to be, mind the pun, baptized in ceremonial washings, covered, immersed in ceremonial Old Testament or or maybe New Testament washings and acts and rites and cultic deeds 
But God says, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord. It's as if on a human level, water washes away our guilt if we're lying to ourselves. You know, we do something, we, we enter the waters of, of the baptismal font, or so we say, I, I, got, I got sprinkled as a baby, or, or my parents prayed this over me, or I got dedicated, something happened to me. My mother hung Jeremiah 29, 11 on a little mobile above my crib. I'm in. It's done. I'm, I, I'm superstitiously in the kingdom. And it's as if the, when we look at ourselves through the superstitious glasses, we say, yeah, I'm clean. In my own eyes, I'm clean. I see no spot or stain. But in God's eyes... He's like that UV light. That whenever other frequency of light is switched off and just that ultraviolet light beams down upon you, the cleanest of your OCD friends, no matter how much scrubbing and cleansing there is repetitively with hyssop and lye and soap, when those UV beams come down from God's eyes, you will see nothing but filth. I wonder if you're familiar with Shakespeare. Am I outing myself as a bit of a nerd? But quoting Shakespeare, do you, do you remember Lady Campbell, Lady, Lady Macbeth, who with her husband Macbeth murdered the King Duncan and she could not get rid of the stain upon her mind and she was racked with guilt and, and she kept on washing her hands in order to try and get rid of the stain of blood on her hands. And then, and then it, it, it racked her so much that in her sleep, she was sleep talking and sleep walking and washing her hands till she was coarse. And she was saying, out spots, out, sp- out damned spots. And no matter how much she cleaned, she couldn't see any less blood upon her hands. That's Pilate. That's you if you haven't had faith in Jesus, but you're very religious. That's you if you hope that anything, anything, anything can wash you and make you white and clean make you acceptable to enter God's kingdom, make you acceptable to enter God's temple, make you acceptable to visit and visibly see God's glory. That's you. You are clean in your own sight, but the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord. Therefore, Hebrews says, as a New Testament conclusion of everything I've just said about water actually having no spiritual power, Hebrews 10 verse 4 says, yeah, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to wash away sins. It says in Hebrews 9, verse 10, these things deal only with food, drinks, and washings for the body until the time of renewal. All of this Old Testament water business was ineffectual and powerless. It was not actually able to save. Hebrews 10, verse 2 makes the watertight argument, what, mind the pun again, the watertight argument and says, if the washing or the sprinkling of animal blood, if it was able to cleanse the sinner, then they would never have done it again. The whole point of an effectual, saving, spiritually cleaning washing is that it washes you (laughs) so that you don't have to go home and come again and wash And then go home and come again and wash because your washing is before the eyes of God who didn't just think about your past or present sins. He washed you in the light of his UV rays which are timeless and all expansive and all consuming. So when he washes, if he washes, he washes past, present and future. You never need to go and be washed again. That's what Jesus told Peter. If you've been washed, you don't need to get washed again. It's done. You got washed. And Hebrews says, so, so if they go back the next day and wash, they are preaching to themselves, whether they hear their own sermon or not, they're preaching to themselves, this washing is useless. That's what they should have picked up on. That's what the book of Hebrews picks up on. So self-acquittal like Pilate and Lady Macbeth, religion or biblical ceremony has no power to wash away the stain of sin. But in Jesus, in the book of Revelation, in Jesus we are shown that his blood is symbolically a fountain. Picture it, a a crimson red fountain or a crystal blue fountain with a huge, beautiful, golden banner above it that says the blood of Jesus, the spring of eternal life, the water of forgiveness. That, that, that spring of water 
coming out of Emmanuel's veins is the washing power. And it has the ability and the effect of truly and eternally cleansing anybody and everybody who are thrown beneath its surface. If you are plunged in that flood, you are washed and washed for good. We picked up on the hints before that the Old Testament preached, which was this, that there needs to be a washing. Remember Mount Sinai, the book of Exodus, before I come and appear on the mountain, wash themselves for three days. There must be a washing before you can see God in his glory. But those washed in the blood of Jesus, behold him face to face. Look at chapter 7 verse 9. I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, all tribes, all peoples and languages standing before the throne. Moses never got so close. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The Lamb. The Lamb that Moses was preaching and typifying every time he killed a lamb or commanded the Israelites to kill a lamb or a goat or a bull or a dove. Every animal killed was pointing to that lamb. Moses only saw them. We in Christ Jesus and Moses by faith in Christ Jesus beholds the lamb in the flesh. Beholds God eye to eye and face to face crying out with a loud voice not damnation and judgment and terror belongs to our God and he will rain it upon us. No, because they've been washed. So they sing, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Or we learned the other hint from the Old Testament that like the Levitical priests, there must be a washing and a cleansing before you can serve God in the temple. Before you can be made a priest unto God, you need to be washed. And this is what verse 15 tells us. Chapter 7, verse 15. They have made themselves white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before Him. They are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And the presence of God does not need to be sheltered from them behind the veil. The presence of God is the shelter for them. The presence of God is not consuming them in wrath. presence of God because they are clean is shielding them and preserving them and protecting them and sealing them in perfect holiness because they've been washed they can serve God as priests or the other hint was that there must be a cleansing in the fountain from the sickness of sin and look at verse 17 of all of the ailments upon the human body thrown away they shall hunger no more Sorry, verse 16 and 17. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The blood of Jesus does what all of the washings and all of the water and all of the ceremony in the old covenant pointed to the need of having done. They pointed to the need of something greater, truer and better and real actually happening to sinners if there would be any hope for cleansing and washing. And that was all done perfectly in the shedding of Jesus Christ on the cross. In dying on the cross, he became for us a gushing river of living water that you and any single person, however many times you've heard the gospel and rejected it, however many times you've sinned, however many times you've blasphemed and hated God, however many times you've worshipped false gods or wished that you could, I don't know. But as many times as you may have done that, still today, the fountain of Jesus is open without fence, without railing, without wall, and you're invited to come and plunge yourself, throw yourself. It is deep. Dive in head first. Take a long breath. It's an eternal life matter that you're about to enter into. Come to the flood of the water that cleanses the blood of Jesus Christ. That is why Ananias told Paul when Paul was was blinded by Jesus and then sent into the town and Ananias was sent to him to pray for him. Therefore Ananias said to Paul, he says, rise, Why do you wait? Rise and be baptized. 
and wash away your sin, calling on his name. What is it that washes away sin? Not baptism. But what baptism enacts, which is the calling on the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The water of Jesus cleanses us. And Hebrews 10 verse 22 says, Our hearts are now sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. They are sprinkled clean and our bodies are washed with pure water. This is what Jesus does. Do you know that this is pictured for us wonderfully in the Gospel of John? When Jesus was upon the cross and he was dying as a real true man, but the perfect man. But the perfect man who was given to carry all of the sins of all of God's people. Our sin, my sin, I hope you can say your sin. Our sin was upon Jesus and became a staining, disgusting, vile blot upon him and upon his person. So that as God looked down in the spiritual realm, to humans he just looked bloodied and beaten. He was just naked and embarrassed and shameful. He was scorned and derided. And he was, he was, to many, he was an idiot. He took on the Roman Empire. He picked a fight with the Jews in his youth, a 30-year-old. What, what a fool. Now he's naked and dying. Probably serves him right. Let's spit on him. Let's throw some of the toilet water at him on a sponge, on a stick, because he says he's thirsty. He was the butt of practical jokes in his death. Jesus Christ. He was dying, mocked, derided, and yet there. As Jesus was being stained by sin, they just saw a human. But as God looked down, he saw under his UV light a filthy, the most compressed, stained, blotted amassing of human sin that ever had been. More more filthy than the whole globe back in Noah's day had ever been. Jesus was in that time millions, billions. All of the souls that are in heaven beyond number that John sees... They are white because all of their blots were picked up and stained upon the life and upon the soul and upon the record of Jesus. And if Noah's day erupted from God a flood of water that consumed the whole world and killed everything, how much more and how much worse was the wrath of God's flood that was sent from heaven into the experience and the body and the soul of Jesus. Isaiah 53 says, God has put him to grief. He crushed him. He entirely annihilated that human being and, and in doing so, paid for and cleansed Jesus' record of all of the sins of us on his record. You see, it would take us an eternity, an eternity of all eternities to pay off sin for so long in hell that eventually we could say, my robes are white. Every blot and stain has now been cleansed through suffering that I deserve to give to God, and now I'm clean. That moment happens for every single soul in hell at exactly the point of infinity, which does not exist and will never arrive. It is an unending, cleansing, paying, purifying, purging. But Jesus was able to carry every layer of robe from every soul that would be saved by him, that John would see in heaven. And he was able to undergo the wrath of God so that one by one the sins fell, fell uh, off, the stain was removed, and he finally paid for every last stain. He was then again a righteous man with nothing on his record, even though sinners were on his record, because he paid for it all. He went into the grave having, having finished his work, and then the Lord God Almighty rose him up again to prove to all of us that in his blood is not merely an ambitious, political, religious leader's empty claims. He really is what John the Baptist said of him, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And as Jesus hung there dying, in all of the different ways that we could look through either anatomy or biology to, say, to, to, to speak about the, 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 the instrumentation of Jesus' actual human death, very likely what killed him was that while he was suffering and the oxygen being unable to properly circulate because he couldn't breathe in the position that he was in and the, 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 the wounds that were bleeding uh, uh, enormously down that splintered cross, he was losing blood, hy hypovolemia, he was also gathering, um, uh, uh, basically it's functionally drowning out of water. 
It's when your lungs are filling with water, but not from the outside. It's because your cells are breaking down and fluid is piling up into your uh, respiratory system. It's called re- uh, uh, plural effusion, water surrounding and going into the lungs. They also had cardiac effusion and pericardial effusion, which is the, the buildup of fluid around the heart. So that what eventually kills people on the cross, most likely in those days, they think, were, was a, 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 a cardiac eruption, literally an exploding heart. Builds up with so much pressure, it just breaks and tears its own fibers. And as Jesus was hanging there, it is evident that he had this um, uh, cardiac effusion going on because when they came up to him to make sure that he was dead, they shoved the spear under his ribs, found his heart, and punctured him, and out came gushing from him was the blood that cleanses us and the water that cleanses us. John 19, 34 tells us that. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear And at once there came out blood and water. That's why that great song, that hymn that we sing, says, Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from sin and wash me and make me pure. 1 John 1, 9 Our last verse of the night says, if we confess our sins, let's make it personal. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness. That's how easy it is right now. If you are an unbeliever and you are here tonight wondering what a benefit, what a joy, what a hope to have cleansing and be in God's temple and have eternal life, What do I do? Where do I pay? Maybe like Naaman, you want to bring a bunch of gold and ask the pastor to give you some of that Holy Spirit juice and get saved or somebody will put you through some magic water, give you some penance to do on your way home and get it all done. Here's what you must do. Confess to God that you're a sinner. Believe that he raised his son from the dead after punishing him for your sins. And would you believe it? You are washed, you are washed, you are washed. There's a song, we don't sing it here, maybe we will soon. It's dear to my heart because visiting Nepal on mission trips, it's a, fa- it's a song that they frequently sing at that little home church that we visit. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for those mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed! In the blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. God, may this exhortation be not merely a quotation from an amazing hymn. May it not just be a consideration of religious sentiments tonight as we gather, but would this be an exhortation spoken powerfully from heaven to souls that are outside of Jesus, that are not washed in his blood, that are still tainted and stained in their sin. Would you please speak that command of life and salvation and washing to every soul tonight that is outside of Jesus Christ? Would you command them, be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Would their souls obey the voice of their creator? Would they erupt within themselves a believing trust in everything Jesus said he was and said he would do? Would their souls lean and cling to and and plunge themselves into the flood of the blood of the Lamb? Father God, those of us who have been washed, would you not let a single day or week go past where we forget this wonderful treasure and everything that it means. That there is nothing we need to repeat because we have been washed once. There is nothing we need to add. Our garments are white as snow. There is nothing left on offer for us to unlock 
or receive. Everything is given to us freely because we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Father God, would you seal this truth to our hearts and may you bless our understanding of your word's truth. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.